Any other comments or corrections? Um, I'll move we accept the minutes as amended. This is Chapin okay. Kaner. Yeah. Do you have a second? I'll second. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> I saw Jill's Jill's hand and Ellie's voice at the same moment. So why don't we give it to Ellie and the <laughs> she's our, our newbie. <laughs> All right, that's great. Thank you very much. Great. So now we're going to dive right into our um, bylaw amendment work session. I do just want to comment that um, we have a very packed agenda once again, and the planning staff have done a tremendous job preparing uh, a video for us, uh, which was incredibly helpful. I hope everybody had a chance to, yes, <laughs> clapping hands, um, had every, everybody had a chance to, to watch it um, and, uh, and hopefully understand and um, uh, have a chance to kind of think about where you sit on, on these questions because we will be, the staff will take us through some of the technical side of things. On a more programmatic note, I would like to hold any questions uh, that come up that are not from planning commissioners to the end of our session. And so uh, given that we've already had several opportunities for public testimony, as well as many letters submitted, um, this is a chance for planning commissioners to work through the details. Um, of course, the meeting is public and we will, um, you know, time permitting, have a chance for questions at the end. Uh, that said, if planning commissioners have specific questions they would like to ask for clarification of anyone in the meeting, um, that should be fine. Um, but we do need to <clears throat> please just pay attention to the time because we, we will run out <laughs> if we are not careful. Okay, so Emily and Matt, you have some, uh, some stuff for us, right, on how to um uh we can how we use this mentimeter and, and how we're <laughs> going to proceed right yeah so s some of you who were around for the charrette work about a year ago might remember the interaction tool mentimeter um and so what we provided you with over uh the weekend was a powerpoint slideshow and and some video narration and it covered about 11 different topic areas that we'd like to focus the work session on tonight, but we want to start with just a survey check of where everybody's at on each of these issues. Um, we have a Mentimeter slideshow that's just the questions that we put in the PowerPoint that we sent you over the weekend. And the idea is to just survey everybody on each of those, really no discussion unless somebody has a clarifying question, and then we can bring that result back up and use it as a jumping off point for discussion um, as we work through the items in the work session. Um, so bear with us. Hopefully this will work. Uh, Emily has sent planning commission members an email with the Mentimeter voting number in it. Um, I can also put that through to folks in the chat. Um, yeah, I if, sent the link that's in gonna the work chat better. too. I oh, think you did too. Terrific. Have one. So if you remember, you want to go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com and put that number in and that will, that will unlock it so you can vote in our survey. Ellie, I think I just dropped it in your chat too. I think I got everybody. And just just shout out planning commission members if you're having uh, any trouble getting into that. Kind of having trouble getting into it. Are you on menti.com, Ellie? Yeah. M-E-N-T-I.com, and it should be asking you for a number. Well, I clicked the link that um, Emily sent, and it's not asking for a number. The link Ellie, I sent in the that, chat just, should directly yes. should take you directly there. Yeah, if you just click the top one that she sent you, then it then you don't have to enter the number. OK. OK, then maybe I am there. <laughs> Um, it could also work if you want to go to your phone um, with the link. 
I have the share screen up, but um, my screen will mirror what's on the Mentimeter. Okay, then I'm good. So why don't we go, um, this was just our introductory slide. Uh, let's go to the list of questions real quick on the next slide. These were the 11 topic areas that we showed you over the weekend. Um, and the first one is pitched versus flat roof. So let's go right to the question and see how this is uh, working for us. Oh, Matt, this might be our test from earlier. Oh, we should clear. Yeah, can you, um, in the present menu, just clear the answers? Um, there we go. Sorry, Emily and I were voting. We canceled each other's votes out on pitched roofs in the test. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's try again. Hmm. Oh, um, oh, hang on a second. I, I am seeing the correct, I think I'm seeing the correct question and slide. Um, Reset. All maybe slides, maybe there we go. Uh, maybe that sorry. you're in the... I, I voted as soon as it came up, so when it said oh, one, okay. in one of that, it might have been me. Okay, all right, let's, I've reset all slides so it should have any of our dummy votes out. Let's try this again, now vote. All right, so this was our pitch roof question. All right, that's six responses, which is all we should have. Uh, let's go right on to the next. And this was a question about the required minimum size of door yards, and there were a couple of different answers uh, you could give here. Okay. Next question. This is about building heights and whether maximum or minimum uh, building heights should be changed in the building form standards. Oh, good. Great. Okay. Did we get six responses on building heights? I, I might have missed it. Four, yeah, five, six. Four, Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Great. Thank you. And and we had a specific question about whether single story buildings should be allowed uh, anywhere in the form based code overlay district. Three, four, five. Okay, next question. This was about changing the maximum building footprint from 15 or 18,000 square feet up to 20,000 square feet. All right. Next question. Parking requirements and should they be changed? And while folks are voting on this, I'll just direct your attention on the agenda webpage in your email box uh, in both places. I have prepared a summary table about the parking requirements in the current draft. Um, you don't necessarily need to look at it right now, but it should help any conversation we have about parking tonight. All right, that's six responses. This is about amending the regulating plan uh, as discussed, adding some developable area in the Essex Alliance Church area of the regulating plan. Okay. We'll Next be discussing question. this one. <laughs> 
this is about uh, regulating plan amendments as discussed for the Cottonwood Crossing area. I would say yes. All right, let's move on. All right, and this was another single story um, question specifically about allowing single story south of Marshall Avenue, uh, primarily in the Taft Corners Associates lands uh, as represented by Mr. Nick and Mr. Davis. All right, there's our six answers. Number 10. Sorry, nine, nine 2.0, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, this, is a, this is about shifting the trader lane green. Again, a issue that was brought up by Mr. Nick and Mr. Davis. Okay. I think now we're on number 10. Mm -hmm. um, this, this question, it's hard to read on your slide, but it was a, a fairly lengthy statement about um, regulating plan and official map and the fact that in the current draft, those things need to be amended as a bylaw amendment if anything is gonna be moved on those more than 75 feet. Um, so this explains that that process um, and asks for uh, where you are in your scale of agreement with that statement. All right, that's six responses. And I think we're on to our final question. And this one lets you type in text. So um, is, there, is there something we haven't covered in these questions uh, that you'd like the group to talk about prior to select board transmittal or a decision on select board transmittal? You can leave this open for a minute or two. And um, if, if folks don't have anything to say here, you can just say no comment or um, I'm all set and that's fine too. Anybody still typing? Oh, there's one. Yeah, yes, I'm still typing. All right.
I'll stop. Okay. <laughs> Terrific. Um, so we'll have these survey responses available to, to bring back up and share as we jump off into each of the topic areas listed on the agenda tonight, as well as I think some time to dive into the comments at the end here. Um, so I would suggest that we, Megan, I'll turn it back over to you and then we might just take these in order. Uh, staff, we'll do, we'll do whatever we can and, and share whatever information you need as you request it. Um, we can call up the slides from the PowerPoint we prepared for you over the weekend or other information from the regulating plan. Um, Jeff and Taylor, I believe are both in the room tonight if you want to ask them specific questions and uh, that's what we've got for the survey activity. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. I don't actually see Taylor on. Oh, that there he is. He's called Chittenden County. <laughs> okay, great. Um, hi, <laughs> you are. Um, yeah, I think you know. I think my. I think the slides would definitely be helpful. Um, and the I feel like the Mentimeter surveys were super helpful to get a temperature check on a lot of these issues. Um, so <clears throat> if, you know, I guess my preference is to kind of go through, um, you know, just make sure we're good on the pitched roofs and or flat roofs and, you know, kind of review, can we, can we have like the slide and maybe the survey response side by side or something along those lines? It gets a little tricky. Um, with hand raising in that case. So make sure you use your digital uh, <laughs> Zoom hand because that bumps you to the top of my screen and I can see that you have a question. Um, and just in case you joined uh, our, our work session um, after my initial comments, uh, we are holding questions from anyone other than planning commissioners to the end of our session. So, um, okay, so. Emily, what have you? What are you able to show us? Um, I can screen share the PowerPoint presentation. I'm having a little trouble downloading the Mentimeter results. Okay. Maybe you can uh, verbally represent them for us as we go through. Mm -hmm. um, the Emily, I think if if you just represent the presentation without resetting the responses, it'll just show the bar mm -hmm. graphs. Okay. And then you'll at least get the question slide um, yeah. next to it. It was yeah. it was really hard to see the results. I mean, I could see like blue bars and stuff like that, but um, by the time I squeezed it down enough so that I could have my Mentimeter screen up, <laughs> I couldn't really read the the, the little uh, the key. <clears throat> Oh, it's probably not going to like it not being full screen. Okay, that's fine because we've got the questions here, so that's yeah, that's okay for now. Um, and if we need the slide, um, you can maybe. Yeah. Then so question can... one, um, mm -hmm. there were three respondents saying no change the existing pitch roof requirement with exemptions for solar ready and rooftop private open spaces sufficient one vote for ditch the pitch which is to drop it as a requirement and two votes that for another idea okay so let's start off by hearing from the folks who have other ideas one of which is me but whoever the other person was can go ahead chill that's me i just felt like after hearing what john and marcy had said in that public testimony that is there a way to do things on thoroughfares or in view sheds that we do care about the aesthetic of the pitch versus places that it could be hidden in the middle and be flat and can we accommodate? Is there any, any way to write that? I'm not sure. Um, or would we specify by like a map? Um, but I'm also happy to vote with the first one and say no change. Um, I just was wondering if there's a way to accommodate. Yeah, that was very much in line with my uh, sort of comment as well. Um, and I too am willing to go for um, answer one. Uh, and not change anything. I 
I was, um, I found John Marcotte's uh, comment about the difference of a pitched roof on a two or three story building versus yes. a four or five story building to be very compelling. And, and as I thought about it, I was like, yeah, you know, flat roofs would probably be more aesthetically sort of um, pleasing if they had, you know, nice parapets, interesting corbels, you know, all the good architectural stuff. Um, and then perhaps for two and three story buildings um, uh, where a pitched roof could be an option. Uh, and that, that too might, uh, you know, again, because of the scale and the, the degree of pitch, it just is kind of like more balanced. Um, and if we had some architects here, they could, <laughs> they could help us out with that, um, some official language on that. But, um, but so I guess, you know, my, my personal preference is probably to keep it as it is, but allow, um, you know, but be pretty generous with the flat roof option um, in turn, particularly for four or five story buildings. Uh, discussion, thoughts on that? I like that because I think we already limit single story. I mean, that's one of the things we're talking about tonight. And I think what I don't like to see is single story flat roof. And I think, you know, I love the modern buildings that have been going up in South Burlington that are flat roofed, but you know, three stories tall. I think they look, I think they look great. Right. Okay. Chapin, your thoughts? Yeah. Um, I'm the dissenting vote and I already said I'm going to go with the majority. And this is a really hard one because I really think it's wrong to require pitched roofs. I think it's right to encourage them. Um, and I just wanted to say, I hope people realize that we say in the code that you can have a cutout for mechanicals. And with the current heat pump technology, the cutout is going to be as large as we allow. And so they're going to be sort of skirts of pitch around the outside of the building, not what you would think of as a pitched roof in some ways. Thanks. OK, Shayla. Um, I would be willing to go with the um pitched for lower buildings or or you know view shed buildings um and and allow a greater exception if that is again a doable thing okay um thank you that seems to be a, a little trend here kate ellie what are your thoughts um I'm fine with that as well. I mean, I think there are definitely certain buildings that, you know, it wouldn't be ideal to have a pitched roof. Um, mm -hmm. So if we can, we can make places where they, you know, where we really would like to see them or on certain types of buildings, then I think that's fine. Yeah. Ellie, what are your thoughts? Um, I'm also okay with adding more flexibility into the, into the code for this one. Okay, so this is kind of a middle road um, staff, folks. <laughs> is there, uh, and, and maybe, oh, see, Taylor has his hand up. Um, it, you know, if, if there's a way to, um, you know, encourage pitch roofs when they are, you know, two or three story buildings, does that make sense? Is it, is it sort of enforceable? Is it logical? Um, and it wouldn't necessarily have to be all two or three story buildings by any means. Uh, but I think, I think there is a sense, there had been a sense from the beginning of our form-based code discussions that pitched roofs are a sort of regionally, historically interesting feature. Um, you know, that said, a lot of main streets in, in New England towns do have the flat roofs. We've all seen lots of pictures of those. Um, but all of Taft Corners isn't going to be the main street. So uh, so I wonder about a little bit of balance there. Taylor, go ahead. Yeah, uh, just looking for guidance because <laughs> we, uh, we've got to code this. Um, so um, uh, Jeff Farrell, uh, help save me if, if uh, I stumble too much. And, and Matt, please provide guidance here too. But um, I'm not sure we could probably craft a regulation on the fly right now, but what I'm hearing is two, three stories. We, we probably want to require a pitch. Um, four or five stories, not necessarily. Um, 
have it be an option, but not, don't require, and perhaps even allow that flat roof um, in more circumstances, not just with mechanical, not just with solar ready, not just with green roof, but just just allow it. Is that what I'm hearing? Ooh, ooh you're on mute, Megan. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I think that would probably suffice because um, because the current require you know the current language is to require pitched roofs, except in a couple of circumstances. So if we just relaxed or added to those circumstances, maybe that would that would do it. Um, is that does that enough, Taylor, or do you have more? <laughs> I mean, that's probably enough. I want to see what Chapin has to say. Okay, go ahead, Chapin. Um, I, I was, you know, I laid out my reasons in my letter, so I don't need to repeat them. Um, and I'm going to go with the majority, but I did want to mention that one of the reasons for pitch trees was to have a feeling that was sort of unique to Taft Corners. And I think our requirement for balconies on a third of the street facing frontage and so forth is going to give a very definite feeling that plus the wide tree belts and so forth. And so I just wanted to say that I do, I, I agree with that reason for talking about it. Um, and I really am like the compromise idea. And I, the other comment I wanted to make is that overall, we're not gonna get this 100% right the first time. And so I think, um, you know, between when we put this code in and when the first building is ready to be uh, designed, maybe a little bit of time, I don't know. But I think um, if we wanna give it more time, we should put either in and, you know, make a best shot and just say, this is something we're gonna revisit in our first rewrite. Cause there's about five things in this list where I think that we need to do more work, but I also don't think we should hold up the process. Fair enough. Okay, Jeff, can you wait? Are you gonna weigh in on this? I called, I called on you right as you took a sip of your, your beverage. Oh, I won't tell you what my beverage is. I can guess. <clears throat> um, yeah, I just wanted to point out, I, I, I I think, and I'm biased, I think the, the pitched roof, uh, and I won't call it a mandate because there are the exceptions to it, I think you're understating, they're really pretty large, but nonetheless, I hear, <clears throat> I hear a call to take it off the large buildings. Um, and I think that's too bad, but um, I just, if, if, uh, if we need to do that, we'll do that. I just would make a plea for allowing us to do something simple since this is a code and a lot of things I heard expressed could not be translated into a rule. They were sort of thoughts and wishes and maybes. Yeah. Uh, and we need to give something so that uh, when the uh, when the architects developers look at it, uh, they are at a loss for creative interpretations, meaning they understand it's mm -hmm. black or white. I can do so this, but I can't do that. So that could be taken care of. I mean, more clarity could be added through the regulating plan, right? So in certain spots or areas or types of streets um, that have a maximum of three stories, um, the there could be more emphasis on pitch roofs. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. I yeah, my my knee jerk and 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 Taylor was right when he said can't craft it on the fly. My knee jerk would be to do something uh, in the in the text. Um, it'd be the building form standard section three and architectural section four. I think maybe just for, uh, but probably related simply and directly to height. I don't really know how we would do it on the on the plan itself, place based. Um, mm -hmm. Then you'd be subject. Then you'd be subject to my highly subjective uh, first shot at it, and I don't. I don't want to do that. Um, I I'd prefer to do it something straight into the text, and and maybe just pick a height. Um, despite all the great buildings in the world with a picture roof in the history of mankind, <clears throat> and <laughs> and find a place and cut it off. And, oh, and. and because we've been down this, you know, we had this discussion before elsewhere with some specific ramping up of the requirements for mm -hmm. what people do on that entablature. And I think that gets me back. I think it's a conversation, maybe especially with Shayla, but I, that's a conversation I remember. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to keep us moving along. And so, um, would we want to redo the survey? What What is suggest? Shayla, go ahead. What's your suggestion? All right. I just wanted one more. So just hearing sure. that like kind of ambiguity about how we, that we would need to be more specific. Um, and I'm not sure we're there. Then I would. I would urge us to just go with what we have right now and sort of go with um, Chapin's idea of having it be one of the things we revisit and then, you know, whatever our next round is to, to think about if it is height or if it is placement. Cause I, mm -hmm. my, what I was hearing Jill say, and I, I think what I was thinking of is a little bit maybe more placement and that sounds trickier to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, initial sure turnaround. Okay. Uh, and I would definitely want that, whatever the fancy words are for the thing along the edge. Yes, a, a <laughs> mature or something. Yes, parapet <laughs> plus more. Um, yeah, Chapin, final thoughts? You're muted. I apologize. First of all, I wanted to acknowledge that Ian Campbell has his hand raised, but I hope the end you know that we're waiting till after commissioners. Mm -hmm. Um, good. Um, one way to handle it as a simple rule is to say uh, three stories and up, you're not required. Uh, mm -hmm. Two stories you are, or two and three, you know, just say by the number of stories you're required or not is a simple rule. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I kind of wonder if we should rerun the survey. Is that possible for just question one, Emily? Yeah. So if, if you, if you, if we say, okay, let's, we have to make a decision tonight. <laughs> okay. If we give ourselves that parameter, um, what is your sentiment about uh, the pitched roof requirement as it stands now? Should we keep it? And come back and maybe add some more exceptions and or you know exceptions for a certain building height. We haven't even had the building height discussion yet. Um, or should we ditch the requirement and uh, and depend on other architectural features to bring some uniqueness? So that's uh, basically I'll, the question. Yeah. I, I was the only one who voted for ditch and I'm going to acquiesce to the majority and what I'm hearing from the people who had in the third category is um, keep it but add more exceptions and height mm -hmm. it, and location of the two possible exceptions to be added and and that we may not be able to get the details of that right until next version. Okay. Does so that, that summarize the, the middle. Yeah. Yep. I think so. Um, Okay, can we do this survey again, Emily, or is that too hard? <laughs> and we all have to go to our, our own screens again, right? Mm Chapin, you're muted. I don't know if you're talking to us or not. I was trying. It tells me I've already voted, even though um, I see other people are managing to vote. Uh, you have to refresh the slide. I did. Oh. It still tells me. But I'm doing it on my phone. Ah, uh, OK. And you switched from computer to phone? No, I've been doing it on oh, my phone the whole okay. time. Oh, the whole time, which, okay. Which is great because I can see the results easily, but I can't right. vote. So I was gonna add my vote to the third category, which was the, what I had just summarized. So now I'm confused because well, the first was, one is no change. Right, so the first one is, is leave it as written and we will revisit additional exemptions and qualifications. Okay, in, add me, in the next add me round. to that one. Okay. Add me to that one. Okay. Okay. So that would be six. Sounds like we've got sufficient consensus to this item. Thank you so much, Emily, for all this 
technical magic. <laughs> um, okay, and our next, uh, our next, so I'm trying to go back to my screen. Um, our next question was, uh, which let's see is about door Dory yards. Is that right? Yep. And can we just see the results again? I think there was more consensus on this and we may not need to, yes. Oh, let's see the other one. Okay. There we go. And I wanted to make sure people understand that the pictures in the code don't match the words. You, pro you probably saw that in my write-up. Yes. Um, we did. I think, you know, for me, um, five to seven foot door yard, when you add it to the seven to nine foot tree lawn and the six foot sidewalk, uh, which gives essentially 18 to 22 feet, depending on where you are. Um, am I correct in that, Matt or Emily? Yes. Yeah. So um, to me, that is sufficient. <laughs> when we were talking with uh, Jeff Farrell, um, in other codes he's drafted, the door yard is usually narrower. And based on those early conversations that happened during the vision plan, he drafted our code with a, a wider door yard standard than um, other, other places. Um, I, I had one question about this, and that is how far can the balconies stick out? Uh, Jeff, do you have a sense of that or Taylor? My computer died today, so I don't have the code right in front of me right now, Chapin. But I believe they can stick out three feet from the front of the structure. Don't quote me on that, but I think it's three or four feet from the front of the structure. Um, beyond the facade. Yeah, I'm, I'm also embarrassed because uh, I don't have it open, but, it's, but it is more than that. There's actually a... I, I thought it was more like four or five feet. Yeah, no, it's five feet. Um, yeah. So if we have five foot door yards and five foot balconies, the balconies come exactly to the edge of the sidewalk. Yes, and that's that's um, that was part of the la the latter mix. I think there may have been an earlier iteration where there was one street section that had less than five, and we talked about introducing the balconies and added that added to other you know. Entreaties from you and others, Chapin, about more green. We went up to five as the minimum, so it's yeah. it's a match, right? Okay. Um, did anyone else? Uh, there was four. You know, four out of six um, felt that this was adequate. Does anybody else want to discuss further? Um, I I'm going to acquiesce, but I did want to make one other comment, which is the the presentation from staff, which is wonderful. On this particular item, it kept emphasizing the flexibility that the builder has to build two or three feet further away and have a wider door yard. But that's taking space away from the space they can sell. And I just can't imagine that actually happening a significant amount of the time. Thanks. Okay. Um, all right, well, I think we have adequate consensus on this. So let's move on to the next question. And building heights, <laughs> everybody's favorite topic. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Um, so we had a, a very handy table that showed us the different um, minimums and maximums in the different parts of the regulating plan. Um, and that table is very tiny on my screen. So hopefully the rest of you can- I'll jump back over to the PDF and I can also show the table up against the regulating plan on this slide. So uh, shop front is a subset of town center where there's three and five stories. Um, those are tied together. Transitional neighborhood, uh, the, or, the lighter orange is minimum two, maximum four. And then strollable neighborhood, uh, the yellow, minimum two, maximum three, also with a smaller maximum building footprint. 
Um, that's primarily Essex Alliance Church and the Outer Edge around Cottonwood LaPierre. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, back to the, uh, well, let's, let's just keep this slide up, um, but just to remind you verbally, uh, and maybe Emily, you could read that off for us because I know it looked like four people uh, preferred to leave the table as is. Um, right, and then one person wanted to decrease maximum building heights and one person wanted to increase maximum building heights. Um, keep in mind that the, uh, there is some, um, Matt, can you review that, that flexibility with uh, the sort of attic pitched roof kinds of space, like what, what that would bring as a possible bonus? <laughs> Yeah, so um, these building heights are about the, the number of full stories that are allowed. Uh, there is an additional attic story that is allowed on top of these maximums um, if you build inside of a pitched roof and there's some architectural standards around that. Uh, in terms of physical height, it amounts to about a three quarter story as compared to the others. There is some flexibility of how big or small a story can be um, mostly just to deal with, you know, commercial first floors and things like that. But um, there is an attic story that's on top of these numbers. Um, it's, I wouldn't call it a full story. And if you measure building height in the conventional way, even five stories with an attic story, we're still talking about a total building height, um, not especially different from the 56 foot height different height limit that we have today. Um, steeper pitched roof, measure halfway up the pitch, you might be at um, 60 or 62 feet instead of 56 if you did five with an attic story. Mm -hmm. right. And then particularly if we do move toward um, allowing four and five story buildings to have flat roofs, then that would, that would pull that down a little bit as well. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's gonna uh, bring you back down to just, yes. those, just those numbers. Right. I thought it was really helpful in the in the video um, and slides that you mentioned that the current zoning actually allows four story buildings already um, where there's affordable housing uh, or structured parking, and uh, and so that's you know something I think we all need to keep in mind that it's. <laughs> In some cases, not really much of a change that over uh, over what's currently allowed. And Jeff, did you have a comment to add here? Yeah, a small comment. I just wanted the uh, Planning Commission to, to know that we're pretty particular about um, that attic story. There's a maximum pitch. Uh, so keeping in mind that unless you're quite a distance away, the pitch means it's less vi visible to you because it's falling away from you. We have uh, specific restrictions on the the amount and size of dormer windows that can be to the street. So uh, the attic story, part of the argument for it is uh, the variation in heights and kind of call it a skyline that you'll get. But um, there's a limit on how many dormers. So you really are seeing dormers, not a wall uh, of dormers. So it's uh, it's a little bit of a hidden story, I would say. Yeah. Thanks, that's helpful. Um, other conversation about uh, about heights. This was really helpful, by the way, this slide that you had on here. Um, I think these are really important things for us to remember um, in terms of the tax base, the value of the space, um, efficiency of utilities, efficiency of material use, um, creating a critical mass of population that can sustain local businesses and also other things like public transit um, and parks and the other things that we want. Um, so, but I'm, I'm happy to hear other comments about building height. Um, well, as most people probably know, I would be the, uh, <laughs> in the corner of decreasing the, the height. I am not four or five stories at all. Um, as far as the taxes, I mean, our, our taxes just went up 50% this year, um, primarily because of all the building that's happened, right? So I, I don't see that. Um, but 
I, you know, I think it will change the feel of the town. Um, I, I'm just very against it. I'm, I cannot, I, I guess that's what I can say. I, I'm very against it. I, I, um, it is way, way taller than anything we have there right now. What four stories may be allowed, but we don't have any four story buildings. Um, I would maybe be okay with four story buildings in some places, but I would like it limited. Okay, other comments? I just wanna say, I really feel for Kate and for Donna Rosier that I, I respectfully disagree because I do understand where you're coming from. And I hesitate to say it, but the new terrible hotel looking hotel is four stories. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> I know. Yeah, but with I a really you know. unfortunate, a very unfortunate roof line. <laughs> Um, and various other issues, right? I mean, that wasn't also, found under. That, that, code. Building, that building is also on a main road that no one really wants to walk on. I mean, when you're, when we're talking about this area where you want to make it walkable and friendly, um, I just don't think five-story buildings do that. If you're walking in between five-story buildings, you're going to be, you know, not seeing anything except the buildings. And I mean, it's, it's Vermont. I, I just, it's just not what I expect. I don't think it's what most people expect or want to see. Um, in living in in Vermont, you know, it's not Boston, it's it's not New York, it's. Um, you know, one in terms of kind of what it might feel like, um, I spend all of my work day in and out of five and six story buildings uh, on UVM campus, which, um, you know, are you know obviously a very different land use and and purpose. Um, some are residential, some are, you know offices, classrooms, et cetera. Um, but they, it, you know, it doesn't, you know, for some people, it might be helpful to think about this in terms of kind of a college campus setting. If, if you're, you know, it's, it's perhaps closer to that than it is to um, central Boston or Cambridge or something like that. Um, because there, there is green space, you know, there is variation in heights. Um, and there is uh, articulation of the building facades and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, so that, that's just a, sort of another perspective, but go ahead, Kate. Well, the only problem with that is UVM um, has a bunch of green space. I mean, when you walk the campus, mm -hmm. you, there's yeah. green, I mean, big greens, yeah. and that is yeah. not what is envisioned in this plan. This plan has tiny little blocks of, of green. Um, so, I don't think it. I don't think it will relate. Also, it's not a college campus, but <laughs> I don't right. think it will feel the same um, as that does um, because they're just not the. I, I made another comment that I thought there should be more green space. Um, yeah. So, I, you know, to, to that point, but yeah, no point taken for sure on the green space. Um, yeah, absolutely. Other thoughts or comments on this? Okay, um, I will just add that uh, Alex Staley, who's not able to be here tonight, he uh, joins Kate in uh, not being in favor of five-story buildings. Uh, and so I just want to add his, um, his perspective to that. Um, okay, shall we, do you want to do, redo the survey after our discussion? Maybe we can see where we are. I'm having trouble um, getting it back on my phone because I lost the number, but I, I'm still in the decrease. <laughs> okay, okay, fair enough. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, so there will definitely always be points on which we don't have consensus. Um, and I'm sorry, Kate, I really appreciate uh, your, your thoughts here and your, your perspective. And obviously, Kate, uh, Alex is also in that camp. 
um, we don't know what the select board is going to say, right? So we may be seeing this again, and uh, and there may be other um, other thoughts and and uh, considerations for that. Okay, thank you, Emily. Um, can we go to the next survey question? Is uh, Matt? I just want to check in with you. Is this feeling efficient? Like, are we? Is it a good? process here in terms of going survey question by survey question? Are we missing something that you would like to make sure we hit? No, you're, you're, you're doing well. It's about five of eight. And yeah. I took a fair chunk of your time writing the survey the first time. So this seems to be working pretty well. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, we've gone through three um, of our 10-ish items. So let's, uh, let's stay on this course and see, see how we go. I think we had some, uh, okay, single story buildings be allowed in the form base code overlay district. Uh, Chapin, go ahead. I have uh, two questions about this. Uh, the first is, didn't the vision have some single story uh, buildings sort of like Moe's? Um, in the TCA area um, around the perimeter of the parking lots, or did I remember wrong? That's the first question. I don't remember. That would be a Matt question or an Emily or a Taylor. I was, I was gonna say it's a Jeff question. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to get the passing the bar tonight. <laughs> Um, Before Jeff responds, I don't Jeff. recall that shape in myself, but that was a year ago. So I, I... okay. So I th I thought I had the feeling that there were small. I remember one of the uh, slides was of a somewhere else where there were one story um, buildings along the side of a parking lot, um, sort of to give it more of a feel of a place. Uh, my second question is, if we were to allow single story buildings south of Marshall Avenue, but they had to meet every other aspect to the code, so they couldn't be long buildings, they had to be up to the street, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, would it really satisfy um, uh, um, what uh, Mr. Davis is looking for? Thanks. Um, I can try to answer that if you yeah, like. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Matt. Thanks. Um, there was a there was a slide in the presentation we prepared for you showing some of the proposals around Lot 26, um, and that those are representative of I think some of the challenges TCA faces uh, today in in doing some of that um, traditional uh, big and mid mid box type retail. Um, this was the more uh, multi-story, and then this was the this was what was this 2015? Yeah. Um, so in the in the current code, we have um, some design standards. We have some language requiring placement up on a sidewalk, um, and you know this this was a plan that attempted to meet the letter of that by putting a sidewalk in between the building and the parking lot, and kind of calling the drive aisle and the parking lot maybe kind of sort of a street. You see the angle parking there in front of the large. Uh, retail building uh, near the bottom of the screen in that large picture. So Chapin, I think what I'm really saying is, yes, you're right. I, I think that all of the other architectural standards and building form standards that force the building to be pulled up to the street, uh, that require a certain percentage of the facade to be in windows, which uh, the big retailers always have trouble with, um, you know, wit witness LL Bean, which is doing a pretty good job of putting a big glass door out on Williston Road, but also has a relatively large blank wall because that's effectively their back of house, their front of house spaces, their parking lot. Um, they, the bigger retailers always have a challenge with this. CVS has um, wooden shutters in the bottoms of the windows that were required on their building because it's the back of fixtures. Um, so yeah, you know, lots of other things uh, other than just allowing the single story would still make it challenging. Um, I do believe that applied to a single story building, the architectural standards in the draft code would still bring the town 
uh, a more pleasant uh, and walkable result than what we're dealing with today under the five of nine and the chapter 22 standards. Um, but it's probably, it's probably not everything and it's certainly not gonna make uh, doing retail that looks like the other retail in the area uh, feasible. I, so, I won't even say easy. Yeah. So, so my comment in, uh, well, I still don't really answer the first question, but my comment about all of this is that I don't want to allow big box stores and I'd want all the other attributes to be kept. But I also feel when we're redeveloping something that has a huge amount of parking, it might be most practical to put some single story things around the edge as like what Moe's restaurant is. And so I didn't, that's why I think I answered the, the last category, which is I'm not sure we should outlaw single story buildings, but they have to fit every other way. And they Thank can't you, be Jeff. the main buildings, have to be redevelopment situation. Jeff, do you want to chime in on this? Mm, I, I, yeah, and I want to be careful here. Two things. One, I would uh, sort of ask everyone to be careful about the difference between recommending uh, allowing one story in a certain portion, like south of Marshall, versus overall. And I would add, I'm, I'm just hugely skeptical about the chances to get, uh, and I like the idea too of kind of interim one story development, hiding parking. But Chapin, I think this, the situation in all the instances I can think of uh, is those parking lots are part of mega lease, or really long leases. And when the property gets redeveloped, it's likely to be redeveloped kind of um, big time as opposed to if anyone's going to go to the bank and do a redevelopment, um, they're going to want to, you know, get some bang for their buck of the, the, the bother of getting the loan and putting the deal together. So I, I think the one story buildings, um, I, I, I like the idea, but I think the reality in the situation here of these really large landowners uh, and long term leases is pretty unlikely to happen. Okay, that's helpful. Um, it's very helpful, thanks. Other thoughts or comments on this question? There was some uh, difference of opinion, but uh, maybe we could redo the uh, survey and just check in on that. Okay, um, that seems to be a pretty uh, clear mandate to move forward. <laughs> Again, just a reminder that we will, uh, you know, of course, there's a, this is about transmitting to the select board. Um, <laughs> we aren't the ultimate deciders, so uh, merely rec recommending at this point. Okay, next um, topic, building footprints. Uh, should they be expanded? This was the staff recommendation. I see someone, one person has a different idea, and I wonder if that person could share what their thoughts are. Well, that was me, and I don't really have a different idea. I, I just didn't want to say yes or no. Or no. Mm -hmm. um, because <laughs> This is this is one of those questions that I feel like I don't really have enough um, knowledge to answer. Uh, you know, I, so if I know the developers were saying that's too small for the building of that site, but and I don't know if that's accurate or not. So I, it's kind of more of a I don't know. <laughs> well, I think that the um, that's where for me it was very helpful to have the staff recommendation because they had kind of done that kind of analysis. That like to me, I don't like I can't peg something that's 20,000 square feet versus 18,000 square feet. Um, and, and so I, these are where, you know, to me, this is where we really lean on our experts and, and try to understand, you know, what are um, their parameters. Uh, I did also in, ap appreciate the removal of the grocery store designation because, and I totally understand why 
that kind of a designation would be really problematic moving forward. Um, you know, uh, grocery store goes out of business or moves or whatever. And like, what do you do with that space? Oh, but it's 20,000 square feet. Oh, so it can only be another grocery store <laughs> that causes ma major heartache and uh, <laughs> headache <laughs> and everything <laughs> or whoever's sitting in his seat, right? Um, so that seems more doable to get rid of that grocery store exception and just make everything 20,000. Um, does that help at all, Kate, or you just want to kind of like move on without worrying about square footage? I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. Okay. All right. So let's go on to our next topic. Um, Matt, what did we calculate community bank as today? What was that square footage? Oh, there's about community banks about 13.9, I think. Mm -hmm. It's it's a, it's a funny shaped building, so it's not actually that big. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, in our in our plethora of banks, can can you remind me which one that is? <laughs> Over That's by Cottonwood. New one in Cottonwood. Oh, Cottonwood. Okay. <laughs> yeah. One when one thing I'll say on the footprint topic, just so people understand it a little more, is. Um, when we test out the code on a lot of sites where we have um, given our block sizes and the ownership pattern and you're asking somebody to really sort of take up the street space with a building because that's what's helping to make that walkable street. Um, a lot of folks get pretty close to the maximum allowed building length if you want them to do that. Um, and then 20,000 gives them a little more flexibility on where they land on that building depth. Um, so you know, you're, you're, you're applying a lot of different dimensional uh, rules to the buildings and you always want to be focused on, is this going to, going to create a sort of a catch 22 um, and, and how can we mitigate that? So that was a little bit of it as well. And yes, absolutely on the, you know, the use-based footprint allowance, you know, if the grocery store goes away, I'm not out there issuing a zoning violation <laughs> um, because there's not a grocery store in a 20,000 square foot building anymore. So just cleaner. Not to mention, like the question of what counts as a grocery store may eventually shift <laughs> as we have more <laughs> to go options, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Thank you for that. I wasn't screen sharing. I was the the building form standard. So you know, we have our frontage, we have our depth, and then past a certain point, it drops down. The height requirement drops down in the back, so there's more open um, air space in the alleyway area. So just thinking about all that flexibility when looking at these diagrams provides some of that wiggle room. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a really good point. Um, the maximum footprint that ends up full height is about 14,000 square feet if you go full depth and maximum width. So if somebody was doing the 20,000, um, everything over 14, 440 or so uh, would be in the footprint of that single story part back by the alley. Yeah. So, so it doesn't end up creating a really massive building um, overall with the full height. That was the point I wanted to make. Thank you. Great. Okay, next item is um, everybody's second favorite conversation point, uh, parking requirements. <laughs> And um, here we have, I think finally with this, with the narrated slideshow um, and a conversation with Matt, I finally wrapped my brain around um, the, the parking requirements. So this is, it's not an easy one because we have multiple variables, right? We have residential and commercial, we have shared and reserved, and we have minimums and maximums. And, um, uh, and so there does seem to be a general consensus here that the parking requirements as, as in the code now, um, which I will just remind everyone have already been tweaked. Um, five people are in favor of uh, keeping the existing um, requirements and, uh, and one person is not in favor. So um, discussion, questions? Well, um, Matt, um, oh, go ahead, Kate. No, you go ahead, Matt, that's fine. Oh, I just wanted to say, I apologize for the lateness of preparing this summary table. Megan and I talked about this uh, earlier this week. It just took me until right before the meeting to get it done and 
have Jeff look at it and, and tell me I was getting everything uh, the way it is. But this is linked on the page for your meeting tonight and in your email inboxes as well. Um, I think the big takeaway is um, number one, there are minimum amounts of parking that need to be required that are required by the draft code for both residential and commercial properties. Um, there is a significant reserved parking requirement for residential as well as a shared parking requirement um, that taken together require two spaces per unit um, for all residential. And as far as maximums go, the maximums are really focused on surface parking and they're really focused on reserved parking. So you can build as much parking under a building or in a structure as you want to. You can build as much shared parking as you want to under this draft code. What you can't do is build as much reserved parking, uh, especially for commercial as you want to. And those were some of the examples we gave you in the slideshow. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is when we're thinking about shared parking, uh, when you're driving around Taft Corners or you're, you're shopping in Taft Corners, um, virtually every commercial parking lot that you're in, uh, and I, I use the example of healthy living because it's a new one and I remember doing the calculations, but Maple Tree Place is the same way. Uh, Kismet Fitness Building is the same way with People's Bank next door. Uh, Maple, all, of, all of Maple Tree Place uh, is all understood as shared parking. In other words, um, there's if you go to healthy living now there's there's a handful of reserved spaces in front of h and r block but every other parking space you can be there for healthy living you can be there for felinos you can be there for turner toys you can actually be there for the hilton um that's all understood as shared parking in that approval so um there's quite a lot of flexibility in this code uh as drafted while still requiring a pretty hefty minimum for residential and um a, a pretty hefty shared parking space minimum for commercial. Any other comments or questions from that? Kate, did you wanna? Um, yeah, I mean, no surprise. Um, I'm the one, but, um, you know, I just, and I've, I've stated this before, so we don't need to, you know, go over it again. It's just, uh, you know, Burlington area is, is a disaster to park in downtown. And um, I, I just don't want that to occur here. And I, I think when you start using shared, I mean, shared in Maple Tree Place, there's plenty of it. And it, it's really not convenient if you have to park, you know, a lot of people wouldn't park at Christmas tree shop to walk to, I don't know, the ice cream. I mean, they could, but it, you know, it's, it's more about convenient parking to me because if, you know, if you have to go and you have to like drive around for 20 minutes to find a parking space, um, not good for the environment, right? Number one, but then you're parking and then you have to walk 10 minutes to get to where you want to go. I mean, that's what I'm trying to avoid. Um, and obviously anyone who lives in a building should be able to park their, their vehicle without a problem. Um, so, uh, you know, just, we, we do use cars. They're not going away for, a very long period of time. I, I don't see that happening anyway. I mean, I certainly hope they get um, more economically friendly, I mean, envir environmentally friendly, but I, I don't see them going away. So I do think we just need to keep that in mind. Okay, thank you for that. Chapin? Um, this isn't about uh, parking per se, but it's related. And I did want to ask this question. It was in my write-up. Um, when Chris Snyder said it was hard to have he was worried about the size of buildings because he couldn't put parking underneath if it wasn't a certain size. And I, my question was, is there anything that prevents somebody from having two separate buildings above ground that have one parking garage underneath that's large? Because frankly, I'm in favor of that if it's, but I, I didn't know if we have explicitly allowed, well, I think allowed it or not allowed it. That's that's the meaning of structure, right? Because there's there's underground, but there's also structured parking. Mm -hmm. um, Matt, do you want to clarify that? Well, I would just I would just say that anything that's not on the surface and open to the sky above is some kind of, you know, structured or covered or underground parking. 
Um, to Chapin's exact question, I, I suppose if you wanted to create an underground parking structure and then have more than one building on it, on top of it, um, I, I wouldn't see myself administering the code in a way that, that would say you couldn't do that. Um, you, you, I, I'm not good enough in actual building code to tell you if there might need to be some separations in that parking structure down below uh, if it was serving more than one building. I think some of it comes with the square footage of, of air ventilation, the type of yeah. air ventilation you have, and that gets tricky and expensive. Jeff, Thanks. do you have, have a comment? I would, uh, I would add to that. I was going to say, unless Matt and Emily can come up with something from their perspective that they'd want to limit that, which uh, I, I didn't hear, and I, I would have trouble believing. Anyway, um, the form based code has no no concern about that there's just a required building line that you know unless you're underground put your parking behind it and the whole idea behind shared parking is that all the parking in the middle of the block is shared so uh, i'd say a, a big no problem thanks okay. fair enough um i'd like to us to keep moving on and that was uh i think we're going to stay at five and one, so um, fair enough, we will move along. Um, okay, so this what, uh, was a bit of a head scratcher. So um, I would actually like to ask uh, Emily or Matt to talk us through this amendment. I felt like things were moving a little fast right here and um, this wasn't quite the question I was expecting. So um, <laughs> maybe you can clarify this. Yeah, um, and uh, I think Ellie mentioned it in the chat, the chat that there probably should have been another question about um, including it or excluding it from the overlay district right. area or yeah. um, the comment um, in that final survey question we had about specific plan. Um, so this is the Essex Alliance Church property. Um, I have the vision plan, the pre-app concept, and the regulating plan. Um, the timeline of its permitting history. Some information about the grid streets and blocks. Um, this is the question I was expecting. Oh, okay. So maybe we forgot to pop it in the Mentimeter. Okay. Yeah, that, I think that would be helpful because it, I would really like to sort of get a temperature check on this one. Let's see. Matt, how quickly can I edit a Mentimeter question? <laughs> what? You, you can what? drop one at the end of the presentation. We can just, <laughs> why don't we just vote? We can just vote. We don't need to make her do that. Um, oops, sorry, let me get my screen organized here. Uh, okay, so now I need the language of it. Um, okay, so the question is, should the Essex Alliance Church be included or excluded from form-based code? So if you think it should be included in the form-based code overlay district and therefore subject to form-based code, can you please raise your hand? Uh, okay, so, and me. Um, okay, so that was five. And if you think the Essex Alliance Church should be excluded from the FBC overlay district, raise your hand. I've forgotten how many people we had. Um, okay, Kate. All right, thank you. Um, and the option C was anybody have a different idea, but I think we've exhausted our voters at this point. Um, <laughs> at least we've run out of voters. We may, hopefully haven't totally exhausted them yet. Um, okay, so, you know, this question I think was really in, in some ways the crux of the, the issue um, that we were discussing last time. Chapin, did you have a comment? I, I did. I wanted uh, to just say two things. One is that the both the concept, the original concept for form-based code and the current one regulating plan do not show any connection to the 
wreck path that's coming down from Route 2A. And then Williston has invested a lot in that wreck path all the way from Essex to there, and then in building a bridge. And the intent was for that bridge to be connected to the existing wreck path in Finney Crossing. And it, 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 since it goes all the way to Essex, I'm expecting it to be like a highway that you don't get off and run on the street for a while or have to go through winding pathways, but there's actually a continuous path that's for bicycles and other non-motorized transport. So um, none of the plans, neither Chris Snyder's plan nor either of our published plans have that on it. And it basically it goes right through where we're showing houses. And so I feel like no plan that we've looked at is, is final, is ready to be final. And so um, I, I just wanted to point that out. And the other thing I have to say is primarily that if, by the time that property is completely built out five, 10, 15 years from now, the plan for it may change. And so I would like to see it in the um, form-based code because, and it may get redeveloped later. I don't, even, even if there's some kind of a compromise in the interim, I don't want to give it up. Thanks. Okay, thank you for that perspective. Um, Matt, do you want to address the bike path question? Or yeah, um, so I believe, and Jeff, please please chime in here. We have a street section with a completely separated cycle track that provides this connection. Jeff, am I overstating that? Um, not here in, in this section. Uh, the, the bikes, as it's, as it's run right now, the bicycles would be uh, in the street. And, and I think okay. in this section, I mean, these streets are so short, narrow, and local that the, the bikes would actually rule. But we, we do have the connection. We have added that connection. We added that connection from the existing bridge to the north of the property. You know, in a in a green space, we've we've got like a thirty foot uh, wide strip to the road from from the, the the bridge. That's what we've added. Okay, and so um, is is that sounds like basically what you were looking for? Is that right, Chapin? No, I, I basically the wreck path from Essex, you know, all the way to Minuski River down to, across the bridge is only a rec path. You don't have to go on the road. And that should, and there's an existing rec path. You don't have to go on the road once you get into the Finney Crossing. And I just don't think there should be a, an interruption to having a exclusively uh, not, you know, if you're going to take your kid out on a bike ride and you don't want to go on roads, you, it's the same problem we have going through Southridge on our rec path from Allenbrook to Williston Central. I just don't think that's the way it should be. Okay, so the bike pass was... runs along Zephyr Road and then it crosses in between Chelsea Commons and Mainstone. Right. And then it comes out near Dunmore Lane. Right. And from that point up to the bridge should be a wreck path that is not a street. So mm -hmm. the wreck path is essentially. Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't it a 10 feet spec in our current specifications in DPW? 10, 10 or 12, yeah. Wide enough for a pickup truck to plow it. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, Jeff, do you have a comment? You're muted. We never got a chance to discuss specifically. Um, it's it's addable at you know changing. I'd say the sidewalk on the outside of that perimeter street mm -hmm. to add the ten foot or or whatever is necessary. Um, so here's and, where it currently runs. So Chapin, you'd be looking for a spec like along this exterior street. Pardon my bad drawing here. Yes, that was somewhere that there were no cars separated from automobile traffic since we have it separated all the way, both before and after that piece of land. Mm. 
But my point about this is that none of the plans have handled that rec path, at least not to my satisfaction. And so I didn't wanna say one is better than the other and uh, neither of these suits Mr. Snyder and there's problems with each. So I just felt like we shouldn't be trying to fix something that's not yet ready to fix because we, so I wanted to just say, stay with the original until we work out whatever is the plan that'll work. Okay, and by original, you mean the what was in the division the plan and the yeah. regulating yeah. plan? Okay. Yes, not that that's what should be built, but that that's, we don't have something that's right yet. And so um, I feel like it, not only do we have something that's right, but we have Mr. Snyder with a concept plan. And I feel like there needs to be some movement. And I don't like the particular changes we made either, uh, adding development on the outside of that outer road. So I do want to note on this plan screen share, let me make sure I'm screen sharing the right thing. Yeah, on the left, uh, the green dot is a continuation of the recreation path through the property. Yes, Mr. Snyder did connect it, but it's going through walking paths with bridges, you know, um, ramps and stuff over that wetland uh, and, and curving around so much. To me, it was not a continuous path for people who are tra traveling from Essex to Taft Corners. It's rather designed more for the local user and then connected so you could go through it. But yes, uh, yeah. I just feel like nothing it hasn't been, happened yet. Okay, well, this may have to be one of those um, points that we return to later to fine tune. Um, I would, my assumption is that this property has <laughs> A great deal of uncertainty and <laughs> wrapped in it, uh, you know, in terms of possible future tweaks. Um, Jeff, did you have another comment? Just a very minor that that um, modifying the um, the outside of that street is a incredibly simple tweak. Okay. Um, and, and so I think in the end, we may do that. I just didn't want to do it if that then locked into a plan that made it the, the rec path not work. And so that's why to me, okay. this needs to be delayed for further negotiation. Okay, well, we've but got a lot on the like, line. <laughs> it, it sounds like, so in our list of things we're doing for the trans middle, middle memo, changing that reg plan spec for that outer street to include the multi-use path, continuing it from Dunmore up and around in a in a less wiggly, more direct way to the existing bridge. Yes, as long as it's not where there's automotive traffic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'll just note that the draft official map that's part of your transmittal package does identify a desired multi-use path connection. Um, from the end at, at Dunmore up to the bridge as well. And we have some language that comes with the official map that says, um, you know, th these, are, these are desired connections as precisely as we can get them, but they may need to be field located. So the, you certainly have your foot in the door on the official map um, if it's adopted that says there will be a rec path, you know, multi-use path connection from um, existing to existing across this property. Uh, yes, that's and I I sort of feel so that's likely to happen under no matter what zoning it goes forward. Uh, Mr. Snyder goes forward with because that's a, a already articulated town priority. Okay. Um, did, did did we? I can't remember what the vote was, but to me it should be in the form based code. But there's more work to be done on the details, but that's true of a lot of things. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so do we want to consider, oh, Shayla, go ahead. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify, it looks like all the alleys are gone in the brainstorm. Is that meant to be that way? 
it's probably the layer got turned off because the brainstorm yeah. is just kind of hashing out ideas in the code. Um, a block can have alleys going north, south, or east, west. Um, and we'll get that cleaned up for the select board transmittal version. Okay, okay, but it is, they are still there in that version. Yeah, that's yep. a great yeah. point, Shayla. Thanks okay. for catching that. No, <laughs> I just, that, that's fine. Thank you. It, yeah. And, and as you can see, my concern on the right hand one, the brainstorm is the red area in the upper right corner might be exactly where the rec path decides to go. We don't know. And so I was not well, wanting to change anything until we knew that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I guess, like, where are we here? We've, <laughs> we've seemingly voted <laughs> that, uh, that, the, that this property should be included in the form-based code overlay district. Um, now we are considering this very, very specific <laughs> um, question about the regulating plan. And um, I guess, oh, okay. So I see Emily circling other chunks that are not on the edge as well as um, making fun purple lines. <laughs> um, so, those were the changes. Right. Yes. Right. And, and okay. my and feeling is very strongly that it's not better than the original, but we also, know it's also the original isn't right. And so, right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so let, why don't we, why don't you throw this question to the, to the voting public? <laughs> Mm -hmm. also known as Planning Commission, and um, and see where we stand. And so please go back to your Mentimeter screen. OK, so. Um, Oh, I see not everybody's in yet. Be patient. Okay. All right. So, so these particular amendments were um, were not seen as uh, supported, um, but we have voted to move move Essex Alliance Church property forward as part of the overlay district. Um, so let's go on to Cottonwood. And the question here was a little small, I can't quite see, um, was about changing the regulating plan. This was a uh, an accommodation to um, and a, a, an effort to compromise by providing additional developable area. And, uh, you know, again, kind of based on a somewhat, somewhat of a brainstorm. And so then the results were, I believe, four in favor and two not in favor of revising it in that direction. So questions or comments? Chapin, go ahead. Um, I was one of the two not in favor, and I wanted to explain that um, in case it had an effect on anybody. And again, I'll go with the majority. Um, I like the idea of compromising with a developer who's already partway through building a project. I, I, you know, I'm not averse to the idea, but given the wetlands, I, it felt like it was pretty arbitrary what we were proposing. And on top of that, if you can go back to the previous one, Emily, um, on the original regulating plan, there's a green corridor you'll see from the south going into Burr Park, just crossing one road. And that could be a corridor for squirrels and other wildlife um, between there and what was beyond. And that we lose that green corridor 
uh, which might be important to the wildlife. So I, I feel like it will be amended after um, wetlands are delineated and um, you know, this will ha it will be revised, but we revising it based on what we don't know was didn't make so much sense. Okay, other comments or thoughts from the planning commissioners? Um, okay, uh, and Chapin, that's an old hand gathering. Oh, sorry. That's fine. Um, Okay, should we maybe could do this uh, do this survey question again? Perhaps people have shifted their thinking. <laughs> maybe not. Oh dear. <laughs> Chapin, you're moving people away from consensus. I don't know what to do with that. Um. <laughs> we just have to go a little further. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I think, I, you know. It, do, it doesn't really matter that much to me because we're going to have to revise it based on wetlands. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, I just, it was, yeah. yeah. I don't know that it matters. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, the, the proposed brainstorm version was um, an attempt to respond to uh, concerns from the developer and, um, you know, perhaps not as much as they wanted, but um, it was a, a sort of reach across the aisle. And um, we know that it's going to have to change because of the wetlands. Um, and and that delineation. So, um, Matt, suggestions? <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if I can help guide anybody's thoughts on this, um, you know, we, we tried to provide some context in your slideshow about uh, what, what past impressions of the nature and extent of wetlands in the area might be. Um, you may recall that the, the reason for the brainstorm version was comments from the developer about um, wanting more um, streets that had development available on both sides to help spread the cost of constructing those streets across the new development. Um, you know, the, the blue you see on that map represents a, a 30 plus year old idea of what the extent of wetlands are out there. They, they may not be that extensive. They may be in different places. There is some topography associated with some of that, but, but not all of it. Uh, and you know, in, in both Williston's rules and state wetland rules, streets can cross wetlands. Um, so some, sometimes some impact may be OK. Um, one of the more important things to me about this slide is it shows the extent of the existing approved Cottonwood Crossing project uh, down at, or up in the corner there, and and you know this is quite a lot of land when you consider the size of Cottonwood and then and then how much land exists um, behind it, and probably the kind of place that somebody would want to spend some time master planning and then work with the planning commission on a um, on a revision to the regulating plan here. Um, either either of the uh, either the original or the brainstorm version of the regulating plan here, I think, does a pretty good job of fulfilling the vision. Um, I think the designations in, ter in terms of the street frontage types from the regulating plan, where you're transitioning out to that lower intensity strollable neighborhood, makes a lot of sense. Um, there are also those differences up against the Bur Oak Knoll. So uh, the red that goes into the green of the Baroque, allowing for some development at the toe of that slope in the brainstorm version. Um, but I tend to I tend to agree with Chapin that it's likely that somebody would be asking you, the developer, owner, or somebody in the future would be asking the planning commission in the future to amend the regulating plan 
in this mm -hmm. location because mm -hmm. it's it's a ways off and there's some constraints that need to be figured out. Um, right. So, um, you know, I'm not I'm not sure. Emily, you you had a, a slide up that had what I said in the thought bubble. Um, yeah, it was basically that about keep it as yeah. is because we're going to have to amend it. I think Chapin brings up a good point about this wildlife corridor to the east and also the original intent with drawing a single loaded street, street along this road is that the public walking along Borough Drive can have that direct access to the Borough Canole. It's not in the backyard of, you know, whatever structures or houses get built along there to keep mm -hmm. the Borough Canole um, a public amenity. So I think keeping the original as is probably is more in line with those vision plan intents and then expect a revision to this quadrant in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that's pretty helpful. Um, any other thoughts or comments? And to that point, I just wanted to say me voting to keep it the way it was is not at all to say we shouldn't um, work with the developer. Right, right. I mean, we pretty much have to, like based on yeah. everything you just said. Um, okay, so I'm gonna suggest that we, we keep it as is, as it was originally sketched out and, um, and move forward with the understanding that there will undoubtedly be, um, you know, quite a lot of changes based on many different uh, parameters of wetlands, future needs, um, you know, other build out constraints or opportunities uh, that may arise that we don't know about yet. Okay, next we have Uh, uh, TCA, let's see, yeah, TCA Commercial Park. Um, let's see, there was um, strong support for leaving the building heights and overlay boundary as they exist now in the regulating plan and the um, reform based code. Um, and some support for excluding the land south of Marshall Ave from form based code. So let's have a, a quick discussion on this one. It does seem that there's a fair amount of consensus, um, but if anybody would like to express a different view or if your thoughts have changed, happy to hear it. or we can just move on. Okay, so um, given that level of support, uh, I'd say we should move on to the next question, the next, let's see. Oh, the Trader Lane Green, yes. Uh, this had strong support <laughs> to, and I can't quite read the text there. Um, leave, sorry. There we go. Okay. No, leave Trader Lane green as is on the regulating plan. So that was overwhelmingly in place. And so I would propose that we go ahead and move that along um, as it stands. Next question. Okay. And then with the statement, and I think we'll definitely need some large <laughs> letters on this for the statement. Are you, Emily, are you able to give us the full slide given that everybody agreed with it? I just want to double check. Yeah. The language, this was, it was kind of a, a lot to read on the fly. Although we have the- It's, it's, the basically, that, it's basically that we want to keep it a legislative yes. process Right. Um, and that we basically, we have to make zoning changes if there's a change to the regulating plan. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, glad to see that everybody strongly agrees that, that, that we should reign supreme <laughs> uh, and keep our power, right? No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, really, this is... Um, this is, in my view... 
one of the reasons that this is preferable, and I don't, I'm not going to beat, uh, you know, beat this to death, but um, this, the, the form-based code, and the regulating plan, and it's the levels of flexibility, um, depend on a level of deliberation and transparency that I am very comfortable with. And uh, I think that we should hold on to that. So that that has certainly been informed my, my perspective on this. All right, since we all strongly agreed with that, I think we can move on. <laughs> and uh, let's see, are there outstanding topic areas? So let's get to our last section here. Um, yeah, so certainly the question of green space, um, Matt, I know you've had, you've, you've had several people <laughs> <laughs> raise that question and, um, and, you know, to some degree, uh, there's, there's only so much we can do, but maybe you want to kind of give us a quick summary of that, where we stand. Sure. A um, couple things to think about in terms of green space. Um, number one, uh, what is mapped as green space on the regulating plan represents a really huge step from where the town is today in its bylaws. So uh, virtually all of the green space identified on the regulating plan is privately owned. Um, the regulating plan backed up by the proposed official map would put the town in its very strongest position to be able to require that green space to be created in those mapped areas uh, and that it come into public ownership as a component of any new development proposed on those parcels. Um, it is certainly not a guarantee. And as you know, uh, from times I've talked about it before, uh, putting it on the official maps means there's a process and ultimately if the select board chooses not to pursue acquisition of that land and and, and not to require it as part of development uh the person proposing development who has that green space um is off the hook um you know the hope is very much that that's really never the process and that there's usually a cooperative um process that that gets that green space in as a public element of taft corners but you know, right now Taft Corners is just about 99.9% .9 privately owned. Um, and while there is green space in Taft Corners, it's the kind of green space that uh, the owner can, can ask you to leave um, if, they, if they want to, including things that might feel public like the Maple Tree Place Green or, or the eventual Finney Green. Um, so it's a big step forward. We mapped some areas in the regulating plan that line up with what um, was discussed in the vision plan. The comments I think we've heard uh, about this topic have universally been there should be bigger green and more green planned for Taft Corners. Um, and so I, I, I can't tell you there's more on the map than there is. There, there is what there is. Uh, I spent a little bit of time today looking at the regulating plan superimposed over the um, Google Earth ortho photo to try to think about other places you might require something. There's probably a few, and, and I would throw out that like any other element of the regulating plan, this is certainly one that can be amended as the town's desires change. Um, and in particular, if the town desires to map locations for additional planned public facilities, so not just greens, but you know, community centers or facilities or other things like that, uh, it would make all the sense in the world if the town decided it wanted, for example, a, a civic building in Taft Corners to get that on the official map and try to try to collaborate to, to get that land uh, into town control. So that said, the other exercise uh, Emily and I spent some time on today was thinking about something that's that's not illustrated on the regulating plan. And that's the requirement for private open area, which is another kind of green space that comes from our building form standards. So when you're looking at the regulating plan, um, everything on the regulating plan that's white is, uh, with the exception of where the alley lays over it, that's the buildable area. And so what the, what the uh, zoning, what the form-based code draft says is that if you've got your lot um, and, and 
you have your portions of your lot that are white where a building can be built, take that area, generally 15% of it needs to be provided as private open area. There's a couple ways you can do that, but you know, just by way of example, um, we looked at a 50,000 square foot lot. Um, I can't remember, Emily, was that the community bank lot um, at Cottonwood? Yes, we did look at community bank. So we looked at the lot you'd put around the community bank at Cottonwood. It was about 50,000 square feet. Um, so 15% 15, 15 of that is about 7,500 square feet. Now, if you were building a building on that site today, you'd have to pull it um, up to the street. You can see that blue box Emily's got on the regulating plan, um, which would make a little bit of room. Um, and you'd need to come up with 7,500 square feet of green space. Now, the, it's hard to see because it's in the shadow, but in the pocket of that building, there's a little square, little green square with a patio on it. That's about 2,500 square feet, if I remember. Oh, yeah, almost 3,000. Um, so what the code says is you need a total of 7,500 square feet of green area. You can do a green roof, um, you know, rooftop garden that's, that's usable by people in the building. You could get some area that way. You can get some of it um, in your balconies as long as they meet the minimum size for balconies, but only a third. So even if you max out the balconies, you still need 5,000 square feet of green area on this lot or about twice the size of that blue box um, on the plan. And you need to provide it in no more than two chunks. Um, so it can't just be sort of dispersed all over the place. We, we were looking at the way this site lays out currently. There's kind of a no man's land deep front yard along the sidewalk. Um, it's kind of a funny shape. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't work very well uh, to meet that, that minimum open area requirement. Number one, because we'd be requiring the building to be pulled up to the street, but number two, because it misses some of the minimum dimensions. So the long story short, you take a lot like this and imagine it developing under form-based code. The building comes up to the corner, the green space is um, bigger and more consolidated than you see here. And so when you're backing out and looking at this regulating plan, it's really helpful to imagine um, that, you know, there's, there's a 15% green piece or 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 minimum two or three pieces of green inside every one of these white blocks that actually takes up a, a pretty good chunk of that block um, so remember that the green spaces on the regulating plan map are planned public greens and parks that would be owned and managed and and um, partially developed by the town but there is other green the other point i wanted to make um, is there's a lot of green coming along with the streets. So when you look at that regulating plan, you see those big, wide, orange and yellow and red layouts. And remember that those layouts include the dooryard that's on the private land. They include the tree lawn. They include the sidewalk and the street. And so when, when you're seeing that big, wide orange line, what's inside of that orange line actually looks more like this. Um, this one doesn't have the trees on it. Jeff, I think, emailed me one with the trees on it after that, sh that shows it planted up. Yeah, there we are on the streets around the Trader Lane Green. So um, remember that it's not just what's on the regulating plan that makes up the green here. There are park spaces. They are significantly sized, but there's a couple of other ways that green space happens just in your transmittal draft as written today. Um, and I and I also fully agree that just like changing a street or planning for any other kind of public facility, using the framework of official map and regulating plan to come back in um, and add additional public green spaces, you know this is this is a piece of the Lego set. You can you can come back in and rebuild sections of this as the town's needs unfold. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, Chapin, you have a comment? Oh, and oh, Joe. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, should, do you want to go first, Joe? Or... 
um, I couldn't hear you, I'll, I'll go. Um, it, it's that what we put on here as public green space, the private green space is one thing and it can be, it can be rooftop and balcony plus interior space or whatever, but public green space of any size has to be on this regulating plan to have a chance of existing. And what's on this regulating plan is the maximum amount that will exist unless we uh, uh, amend the plan. And not all of it, so not all of it will get built. It, there will come times that the developer insists on something else and the town can't afford to buy it and we will lose that green space. So I just feel like we should have more. However, I don't feel we should hold the process up. So I would just like to say we'd like like to forward this onto the select board, but with a note that we intend to work to find more green space. And an example, I under, don't understand why it wasn't accepted that I have put forward is that between the 99 restaurant and Day Lane, under the um, power lines, where there's currently a picnic table and a gazebo and stuff, why that can't be on the map as green space. And so I think that's the example of the kind of place that we, sh we need to put it because there's not enough in that quadrant. Right there, yeah, right there. That's existing green space that we have not reserved on the regulating plan to remain green space. And I think we should. So I, I don't wanna to try to amend the regulating plan before we forward this to the select board, but I wanna say we need to add more green space in the first amendment round. Okay, thank you. Other, uh, let's see, Jill, go ahead. Yeah, mine was you know similar to what Chapin's saying is that um, I don't want to get stuck with the Finney Crossing example that we were given in that strongly agree vote of like here's where we were promised a theater and now we have pocket parks. So I think I'm with Chapin on that as much as we can kind of um, mark and note now knowing how processes work uh, is advantageous. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for that, Jeff. Go ahead. Um, you should be aware there are specifications in, in the code for what happens in those green spaces that will prevent them from being, um, you know, leftover places with dying grass. So, so the, what happens in there is, is thought about. Yeah, I think, I think Jill's comment was that um, in the slideshow, uh, the discussion about the, pre, the original plan for Finney Crossing and the amount of green spaces and, uh, you know, an amphitheater and all kinds of amazing tantalizing things uh, versus what was actually built in the end. Um, I realize, of course, some things were moved probably elsewhere and, and maybe there were some, uh, you know, other kinds of compromises that were made, but um, I yeah. think it does, it does make us consider the fact that uh, we, we, need, we need better tools, right? We need a better, um, <laughs> a better process <laughs> for making sure that, that the green spaces we desire are, are truly. Um, yeah, why you have a regulating plan too. Exactly, right. Okay, um, back to our slide of open-ended comments. Um, I think there were a couple more that we might want to tackle. And just as a time check, we're almost nine o'clock. Um, I would like to see if we can wrap up this conversation in the next 10 minutes. And I'm hoping on that one, we can just say then in the transmittal letter, we say that there's strong desire yeah. to uh, yeah. add more green space. But... I think so. Um, so two of us have noted uh, this question about the streamlined amendment process. Um, that uh, I also wondered about that. The, the Taylor had suggested. Um, my sense is that we don't necessarily need to uh, create that now, but that we perhaps that goes into a transmittal memo or somehow is um, identified as a future work uh, task. You know, Matt, what you do you think of? Okay, I have a 
I have a thought and Taylor and Jeff, this would be a text amendment um, in, in section eight administration. So we do have a section in the draft code about amendments to the regulating plan. Um, and it sets, it sets out some boundaries uh, about trying to you know, maintain block patterns and, and things like that uh, if the regulating plan is amended. So I'm in, I'm in 8H on page 93 of the code draft. And right up, oh, sorry, H is, H is now administrative and I is amendment. Sorry, I was looking at an old one, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so any other proposed changes, I'm looking at number two there um, on, on 94 now. And what I would suggest in, in the name of, of streamlining is essentially stating that the planning commission will review requested amendments to the regulating plan as a bylaw amendment. Um, it's a little bit of semantics, but um, you know, planning commission members know when someone wa wants to amend the bylaw and they make a written request, we put them in front of you, we, we consider it, um, we ask the planning commission, do you want to take this up? Um, we've talked about it in balance with work plan and things like that. And I think where, where I would go around streamlining would be to just offer the idea that we would write something in here that says it is something you know, upon application of the Planning Commission, the Planning Commission will, will review and, and make a decision um, in some kind of timely manner. Um, and, and in other, other words, we build a little bit of prioritization that the Planning Commission knows this is gonna be on its, on its plate um, when somebody wants to change this plan. Taylor, am I way off base? Um, no, Jeff, I, I think- the place where we want to put that. Yeah, this is probably where we want to put that language. Um, I would add a, a couple things to that language. Um, one, I would want to be very specific about what the request entails. You know, I, I, I would want to know very specifically from the developer about, you know, where they're proposing to move that road beyond that 75 feet we're allowing and, and what sort of frontage they would like along that new road. And and so I, I want to be very specific. I, I don't want to set up a situation where it is kind of like, we want to change it, you know, have a, have a hearing. And, and so I, I want to be more specific about what's required in the, by the developer to start the process. Um, yeah, I would want to be pretty specific about the, the timeline in which the PC kind of self-imposes the deadline to review upon complete application by the developer. Um, you know, 90 days seems pretty streamlined to me. Maybe more like 120 would be more realistic, but we can we yeah. can talk. Um, you know, this is probably overly complicated, but you know, repetitive applications too might get annoying. Um, you know, so you may want a provision there just to prevent, um, you know, they, they have this with, with quasi-judicial hearings, with stuff that actually goes to DRB. There is a provision in state statute about um, you know, once there's, once there's a decision, there's a decision, you can't keep applying for the same thing. We could probably do the same thing here saying, you know, you can make a request for the, for, you know, this area of the street, you know, once every five years or something like that, um, to provide some protection to the PC from seeing repetitive applications. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so yeah, I think you got the gist, Matt. I think there's some specifics to, to think about. Um, I think I'd probably advise what Megan was saying, which is, you know, put this idea in your transmittal memo. Staff and Jeff and I can kind of work on some language in the background and be pretty ready to go at the select board level if this is something the select board wants to act on. Does that sound okay? Some of this to me sounds like it's more when we move into the administrative checklist phase, you know, the next step after the code is adopted is the transparency checklist for the zoning administrator making the findings. And I see ways we could mirror what the DRB does in terms of here's the package that's submitted, here's the questions that you answer. So the planning commission has having a very efficient discussion. Okay, where is this street going? And we're talking about very concrete, a couple site plan concepts rather than 
you know, a more nebulous discussion where you can get right down to it, make a decision, move on, kind of like a DRB hearing, but not just mirror that process for efficiency. Yeah, that's yeah. a great idea, Emily. And, and Taylor, um, I have some language I can give you to mirror that that essentially just says, you know, the zoning administrator in concert with planning commission shall develop an application checklist denoting the information that's required when an amendment to the regulating plan is requested. Okay. Um, so in other words, gives, gives the administrator some leeway to work with the planning commission on what is the required sort of amount and level of information if somebody wants to change the plan. Um, and, you know, we, I think, you know, the process needs to live in the code but those informational requirements and application requirements um, can be can be developed administratively. We've we've mm -hmm. done well with that in the bylaw. Okay. And Matt, wasn't there the concept that the planning commission would, you know, they would make a vote on a recommendation to transmit <coughs> to the select board? So even if you really didn't like a regulating plan amendment that was being proposed, and you could say the planning commission likes or dislikes this and here's why and then it goes to the select board was that a thing or no i like that idea taylor i see your mic unmuted i mean <laughs> I, uh you know that's not a uh statute doesn't talk about that I'll say it like that. So, you know, the PC could self-impose that though and say that, you know, we'll we'll review any application, we'll move on any application to the select board regardless of how we feel as the PC. Um, do you want to impose that level of, of uh, I don't know, I, do you want to take your take away your own power like that? I don't know uh, if that's a good idea or not. Um, <laughs> but you, you could, Emily, you could, I guess. I mean, because that would only be if the plan wasn't going to go through. Because if the planning commission voted yes on a regulating plan amendment, it's going to the select board anyway for adoption. It's just if the planning commission votes no, it's still the select board still gets a chance to talk about it. I don't know. But then, what's the use of the planning commission? Like, if if we would we if we advise no, then. Aren't we just setting up the select board for a lot of yeah. kind of hassle and, if, you know, it's if we can't, yeah. Uh, to me, if it's in the middle, if we can't decide, then we could pass the buck, but we could, we could do that anyway. It doesn't have to be in statute or it doesn't have to be in the mm -hmm. bylaw. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. So maybe that's something that just gets resolved in our administrative mm -hmm. checklist and our administrative policy of how the planning commission can work through an application. Yeah. Based on comments by commissioners, I would say that we're also going to have some commission initiated uh, requests for amendment. Um, so we should make sure we allow for that. Yeah, good point. Can amend at any time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh I had a, can I make one comment? Yes, Megan, I go know ahead, we're, I, know we're gonna then... try. I just wanted to say there, there's a lot of things in the regulating plan that we haven't been over in detail and that there's probably good reasons why they're the way there are. And then sometimes we don't always understand them. And an example is I think there's a link between Bishop and Walnut that doesn't line up but going across Route 2A. And then there's Merchant Row that does line up. And those are two additional crossings of 2A between to existing ones. And there may be a reason for that. And it, um, what I wanted to say is, I just feel like th there's a lot of things about the regulating plan that we'll wanna look at in the long run. Yeah, right there in the middle. There's are two new crossings of, sort of crossings of um, route 2A and the Walnut to Bishop doesn't line up as you can see. Um, and so I thought it was possible that, uh, yeah, well, I just want to say it's possible we want to make changes. The other thing is to, to um, Mr. Davis's point, we haven't designed stormwater facilities that are shared and they may even be municipal. And they may, doing that may, with the, in cooperation with the developer or on our own, may 
identify places that can be open green space that's usable by the public that also serves the function of stormwater, shared stormwater. And so I feel as though there's some good opportunities. Um, and I, although I feel a regulating plan, it's really good that it be um, legislative. It is also a given that we will have to look at revisions much more so in the first five years than in the next 50, I think. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. um, Taylor, go ahead. I'll be very fast. Um, I just uh, Chabin talking about Walnut in particular um, made me think of, of the fact that um, staff and consultant team are trying to set up a, a meeting with VTrans um, to look at the official map and regulating plan um, because obviously that's <clears throat> in two remain state state highways. Um, and so um, we imagine that VTrans may have some comments on the official map, particularly <laughs> In areas like Bishop and Walnut, um, and and you know if they have really substantive comments about that, we'll encourage them to bring them to the select board. Um, you know I don't know if that means changes in the near term, but go ahead, Jeff. I guess I got on that one. I got to say, come on, guys, uh, look look at what's before you. Bishop and Walnut, um, they both exist, and they don't line up, and we're not going to get them to line up unless we become uh, Vladimir Putin's. And arrange, uh, you know, rearrange the property lines and the existing buildings. Uh, that's that's n not a good example of things that's going to have to be changed because it's actually something that can't be changed. Um, and no, they're they're probably will end up being right in, right outs, which I have a feeling mm -hmm. they are right now. But right, that, Bishop is a right in, right out. So I I thought the trans conversations they were going to see those streets as also being right in, right out for the, if Walnut connects through. Okay. <laughs> um, I would love to entertain a motion uh, if, if we feel like we're there. Um, is everybody feeling like they are ready to move to that, to that spot to, consider moving this on to the select board? Or is there something remaining? Matt, go ahead. Um, the one thing that in my notes, I'm still sort of seeking guidance on, and maybe you want to do it as discussion on the motion, is the pitched roof question that we started with. Mm. Uh, I have a couple question marks there. So um, could how procedurally, wherever you want to do it, but that's the only one that I wouldn't understand what to do with just yet. Okay. Um, given, Sorry. What, what our, I what I heard on that our... one, I was taking copious notes on that one because I was probably going to have to recode it. What I heard was no change on roofs tonight, and that you'll revisit it, um, particularly mm -hmm. with regard to flat versus pitched, um, based on structure height and possibly geographic location, as a part of future work. That's what I heard. Yeah, that that's fine, and and I Thank think you. that could be again a transmittal memo note that yeah. you know mm -hmm. that we're thinking about other possible exceptions but, to that and other and i think i think we are we unanimous in wanting to encourage pits roofs too so the question is only where mm -hmm. do we not require them right right yeah okay thank okay. you Sorry. Expand the ex right. we're ex expanding <laughs> the exception we're expanding the exceptions mm -hmm. at some point in the future gotcha yes mm -hmm. okay so we have um, any remaining, Jeff, is that a new hand or an old one? We lost him. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't have the, um, I don't have the suggested motion in front of me, but I I'll, have I'll, I'll happy to I'm make putting it. it in the chat right now. Okay. If, um, but for some reason I can only, send it to Emily, I'm not sure why, so. Oh yeah, that's our, our Zoom bomber prevention strategy. Right, that's great, <laughs> but maybe Emily can forward it to the rest of us. <laughs> forward or it she's back. putting it up on the screen. Oh, over on the screen, that's fine too. Okay. So shall I go, I'll, I'd say I, Chip and Kaner, move that the Wilson Planning Commission having heard and duly considered the public testimony of February 1, 15 and March, First, transmit the bylaw amendment form based code to the select board for adoption as amended this evening per discussion this evening. 
Okay, any second? I'll second. Thank you, Shayla. Okay, folks, this is the, the exciting moment. <laughs> All those in favor, say aye or raise your hand. Aye. Uh, opposed? Abstentions? I'm, you I'm, I'm opposed. You're opposed. Okay, Kate, thank you, so noted. Um, okay, so I think we had five in favor, one opposed, and no abstentions. Is that correct? I catch everybody? Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you so much <laughs> to this very, very long process and so many details. Um, Matt, do you want to kind of give us our summary, moving on, yeah, skipping the next so, meeting, et cetera? <laughs> um, yeah. So, so first off, again, uh, thank you, everybody. Um, this has been a long road. There is definitely a bit of a road ahead um, as, as this proposed code change navigates the select board process. Um, as we mentioned in the announcement for tonight's meeting, uh, the recommendation is that the Planning Commission skip its meeting on April 5th, uh, take the night off. Uh, you, you did an extra meeting back in late 2021, so you're, you're due. Um, and staff will work, I think, Megan, mostly with you as chair on drafting a transmittal memo uh, to the select board. And we would like to reflect the very healthy uh, debate that was had on a number of these points. And I think as, as most of you know, uh, in, the, in the opportunities I've had to bring uh, progress reports on this project to the select board, I've really tried to highlight some of these sticking points um, because you know, the, the job of the select board in appointing the planning commission is to appoint a representative group across a really broad range in the town. I think they've done a good job of, on that. We've heard a lot of perspectives from commission members throughout this process um, and certainly look to creating a transmittal memo that, that captures um, that debate and also says, you know, this is what you're getting and, and, and this is how the planning commission sees it and feels about it. And here's some of the things that that they had um, difficulty with and challenges with. This is very much like how we transmitted the vision. Um, it's a great starting point for the select board conversation. Um, under statute, the, the, well, first off, under procedure, the way we'll start is with an informational meeting, joint meeting with the select board. That will likely take place on April 19th. So mark your calendars now. That would be that second meeting uh, in April, also my wife's birthday. She'll be thrilled. Uh, I'll be there with you. <laughs> I don't know if she'll come with me. Uh, and um, that's an informational meeting. So it's not a hearing. It's a chance for the planning commission to talk to the select board about what they're transmitting and why. Um, and then it's up to the select board to decide whether they would like to warn their series of public hearings on that draft. Um, they can do that. Um, they could also at that informational meeting say planning commission, we want you to take this back, do some more work on it and, and hold another set of hearings. Um, or the, the select board may hold hearings. Um, and in the process of those hearings, the select board may make substantive changes. If they do that, it is forwarded back to the Planning Commission for review and revision of the bylaw report, but it's more or less ministerial. You, you revise the report to say whatever the select board changed, um, then you pass it back to them for, for adoption. So we'll continue to follow that process, but it starts with an encounter with the select board most likely on April 19th. Um, and the Planning Commission will be moving on to a whole bunch of other topics um, that that we know are bubbling in the background, and you've seen previews of some of them. So, don't don't go anywhere. We've we've got a busy summer ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Matt. Um, Al, we are over time, but if you have a brief comment, you are welcome to share it. It's just a brief comment. I thought you were going to take um, comments from people that were listening in the whole time, but then that opportunity never came. So would you, maybe you or Matt recommend that if I did have some uh, comments that I just write a letter and send it to you folks? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I would I would say, <clears throat> you know, at this point, that's the best um, solution. You know, by transmitting this to the select board, it's kind of now their baby. And, yeah. um, you know, that, as you just heard from Matt's summary, there are many, many more uh, moments of deliberation and, and uh, public hearings and uh, conversation to be had. So, yeah. um, you know, this is just the beginning of the process. And so, um, you know, I, uh, I offered the chance for questions uh, as, as time permitted, as I said, mm -hmm. um, and given that we normally and at nine, <laughs> and we did. So that, we did. We just didn't have time to, to have any. Yeah, questions. we just That's, didn't. We just didn't really have weird. time, and and we moved through things as quickly as we could, as you saw. Um, yeah. And I apologize. Uh, I apologize for that. For um, you know, I hope I didn't raise expectations. But we did also have, you know, three, as you well know, three public hearings <laughs> gathering. No, testimony. I know, but in, we've read your probably, letters and yeah. so forth. So please, um, yeah, I would say at this. At this point, please, can you um, sure. can you please Absolutely. feel free to write the letters uh, to please direct them to Matt and he will distribute them as as appropriate. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Great. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, oh, Chapin, did you have something can, can, can I make a last comment? I, I had three things. One is that it is going to take a long time before we see the results of all this work yeah. um, because projects need to come in and and so it's people are going to think nothing's happened for a long time. We should be aware of that. We should advertise that. The second is that we have resolved some of the friction points, we called them from when we were working on the vision, but not all of them. And so we still have work to do ourselves. And the last is thanks to everybody, um, including people like Al, who um, gave written comments, and then our, mm -hmm. our staff gave written responses. And for us as planning commission members to see that level of detail of clarity is really, really helpful. And then also to uh, Jeff and Taylor and the consultants, as well as all of our staff, um, it's a lot of work and I really appreciate the transparency and the level of um, detail. Thank you. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you all. Um, and we will see you April 19th. Great. Thanks. Good evening. <laughs>